Yes, they are. citizen in your community badge. Is that right? After the meeting or when you leave, if you go by Mayor Rodolico, who is right there, he is going, whoops, he's walking out, but he'll be here. <laughs> he has some Town of Ledger pins for you. So if you, before you leave, make sure you stop and see Ms. Don, um, yeah, Mayor Rodolico. Sorry about that. Um, at this time, we're holding a public hearing. And if I might explain to you, because I'm sure you you um, young men have never been to a public hearing before, but the town council has a new law to propose. It's called an ordinance. And before we can pass a new law, we have to hold a public hearing to hear what the citizens of the town have to say. So you won't hear us speaking tonight. You will just hear citizens speaking, and we'll give them the opportunity to um, speak We'll listen, but we won't. Um, we won't be speaking. So Although we can speak. We certainly residents. can speak as residents. Thank you. So at this time, I'm going to ask Roxanne to call the um, call of the meeting to read the call of the meeting. The Roger Town Council will conduct a public hearing at 6:30 p.m. on Wednesday, March 15, 2013, in the council chambers, Town Hall Annex 741, Colonel Ledger Highway, Ledger, Connecticut, to receive comment on the proposed. Thank you. Does um, Councillor Steve, do you have anything to add new? I would think probably not. No, I don't think so at this point. Okay. Um, this is the third public he hearing on the subject. So what I'm going to do is ask anyone who has previously spoken to limit their comments to only new information. And then I would also suggest that you limit your overall comments to um, several minutes if you can. At this time, I would ask if anybody, um, anybody in the audience would like to make a comment. Lynn, are you going to do it by people in favor, then followed by a comment? No. no. Good evening. My name is Eric Treister, Ken Honey from Ray Ledger, Connecticut. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to address this, the uh, council on this important subject. I am rising to oppose the proposed ordinance, and I'm going to pass out some photographs. Uh, there are four identical copies. Four identical copies. And there are uh, letters on the back of each one. The, uh, <coughs> as you look at those photos, I'm, 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 I've learned over the years that one of the best ways to test the proposed ordinance is to try it out in the world, real world as much as possible as if the ordinance existed. The, uh, the first one is a picture of, a, of an abandoned gas station. And so I, I know all of you have read the ordinance and you're, 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 you're familiar with it and its contents. So I'm going to ask a question. You don't have to answer this course. But, uh, so you look at the picture of the abandoned gas station. Do you believe that it is a blighted property? And if, if you can hold your hand up, that would be appreciated. Uh, do you believe that it's not blighted? And the 
third question is, is do you believe that the proposed ordinance is applicable to that property? <coughs> okay, obviously, that looks like people are not sure. I'll give you a hint. So, I believe that the property is blighted. However, the proposed ordinance is not applicable because the proposed ordinance is limited to housing blights. If you go to photo B, uh, which is the most blighted property that I could find in the area, it has the yellow and black uh, hazard tape wrapped around this. It uh, looks like it's falling down. Uh, how many people believe that the, <coughs> the ordinance is applicable to that property? Okay. Not sure. If you hint, it is not. The proposed light citation ordinance that is subject to this hearing is not applicable to that property for two reasons. One is that it has never been a residential structure. In 1835, according to Wikipedia, it was a Masonic Lodge, but it, which is not considered a dwelling unit. The light ordinance is only applicable to, to, dwelling, to residential dwelling units, housing, housing light. The other reason it's not applicable, and this is a gray area, is because this particular structure is on the, has been designated as a historic structure, and it is protected under the historic uh, the laws that go over historic structures. Photo C shows a house with a stack of firewood in the front yard. How many people think that this property uh, should be a subject of the, of the legend blight citation ordinance? Not sure. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It is subject to the legend blight citation ordinance. The reason is because blight is defined and I quote, premises containing accumulated debris, and debris is defined as material which is incapable of immediately performing the function for which it was designed, including but not limited to abandoned, discarded, or unused objects. As such, because that stack of firewood is abandoned, or discarded, or unused, obviously it's not being used, uh, the firewood constitutes debris, and under the proposed light ordinance, debris that can be publicly viewed <coughs> constitutes blight. So if a, neighbor, if a neighbor complained about that stack of firewood, there would be an obligation on the part of the blight enforcement officer to send notice, if the notice is ignored, to issue the blight citation, <coughs> but the fine would accumulate, if not paid, uh, the property would be made and the property taken by the town. If you go to photo D, uh, this is the uh, a, a new house that's under construction, uh, but it has a sink with the yard. Do you believe that the proposed or ledger citation ordinance is applicable to this property? For the ordinance. If you're not sure, this ordinance is not ready for adoption. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It is, in my opinion, subject to the ledger cite, light citation ordinance. Uh, but not because of the sink that's in the front yard. Uh, the sink in the yard is capable of immediately performing the function for which it was designed. There's nothing wrong with that sink. And thus, by itself, does not constitute blight. Uh, the structure also does not pose a serious threat to its residents because it has no residents. And it's not a threat to the neighbors unless they're trespassing. And therefore, it does not constitute blight for those reasons. However, the structure is not, and, and the structure is not abandoned as defined in the ordinance. Uh, the, the definition of the for abandoned refers into the building code. And if you take a close look at that definition, it is not an abandoned structure. Amazing. Um, and the building is structurally sound. So why is it blight? <coughs> the reason it is blight is because it is vacant. Uh, section 4, item B of the proposed blight ordinance, which constitutes a blighted premises. It is residential, so the blight ordinance is applicable, and it is vacant. Um, it is unknown if there is a valid building permit, but even if there is a building permit, the blight ordinance does not make exemptions for in-progress work. As such, a blight citation, even at only $25 per day, would result would likely result in a lien being placed on this property. 
and the town ultimately owning that property if the owner has no further interest in it, which appears to be the case. Okay, let's go to photo E. This is a picture of a house with a leaking roof. Okay. Again, I ask the question, is this property blighted per the proposed light citation ordinance?
is assumed that the multiple cars, the staging, the trailer, the boat, are capable of immediately performing the function for which they were designed, and thus they by themselves do not constitute flight coding organs. Uh, if a flight citation is issued, I do, not, I, have, I do not know what the result will be. I don't know if the town would end up owning the property, or if he would accelerate the construction and, and the, 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 the building of the home. It is unknown and a, a risk. Photo H is the most interesting one of all. How many people think that this is a blighted property? Okay, it has a tire hanging from a front, hanging from a tree in the front yard. Is this blighted property? And should it be blighted property? And is the proposed ordinance applicable to this property? Okay, so if the neighbor, remember, if the neighbor is complaining that, that they don't like the tire in that front yard, contact the blight enforcement officer. <coughs> is the blight enforcement officer obligated to start the process per the ordinance? The answer is yes. The tire hanging from a tree in the front yard constitutes debris as defined by the ordinance. It says material which is incapable of immediately performing the function for which it is designed, including junk comprised of parts of automobiles in which poses a serious threat to the safety of both the resident, which would be his children, and the neighbors, which would also be children. Uh, the good news on this one is that if a citation <laughs> is issued because of a low cost of compliance, uh, the odds are great that the, the light would be remediated quickly. Photo I is the most dilapidated house that I could find. And uh, and this should be, this should be basically a, a, a no-brainer, you would say. Uh, obviously, the house is blighted. Uh, the house is also vacant, which means it blighted. It's in a state, state of dilapidation or decay, which means it blighted. It is unable to provide shelter or serve the purpose for which it was constructed due to damage, dilapidation, or decay caused by neglect. Satisfies all of the requirements. There's no question that this structure is blighted. However, this structure is on a very large parcel of land, perhaps 10, maybe 12, 13 acres, very, very large. The owner of that land lives in a trailer about 30 feet away from this dilapidated structure. There's no way in the world that he's going to be able to afford to remediate, repair that structure, or to have it demolished. If a blight citation is issued, and the town will have no choice but to adopt this area, uh, if, if, uh, if, if a neighbor files a writ of mandamus and forces the town to enforce its regulation, it will have no choice but to enforce it. If it enforces its regulation, <coughs> it, will, it will send a notice of violation, which will be ignored. It will send a light citation, which will start the penalty running. And sometime in the next 12 months, there, he will receive a notice of what the penalty is, which is $25 per day, about a little over, little over $4,000 a year. Uh, it will not be paid. A lien will be placed on the property, and guess what? The town will end up owning it. This is why this light ordinance is so dangerous. If you, do, you, do you, as the leaders of this town, really want to put this amount of horsepower in the, in the hand of one light enforcement officer? The next photo is a picture of a treehouse. Okay? Uh, this is an elegant treehouse. It has an architect and engineer's stamp of approval on it when it was first built. About 25 years old. Does this constitute blight? Uh, in the wintertime, it can be seen from a public road. In the, in the springtime, it cannot. Can it be? Is it blight? And the answer is yes. This property is clearly blighted. Uh, like most tree houses, the structure, has, the structure has been neglected and fallen into a state of disrepair, which is dilapidation, which constitutes blight. Uh, and uh, uh, if a neighbor complained about this tree house, the blight enforcement officer would have no choice but to issue a blight citation, start the blight citation procedure. Uh, the good news is that because uh, it can probably be re re remediated in four or five hours, and, uh, a blight citation would probably result in the uh, demolition of the tree house. Okay, that takes care of my real world examples. Uh, and, it, and I provided this to show the seriousness of the subject at hand. 
And I'm going to, during your deliberations later on this evening, I hope that you will deliberate on these photos. Uh, this is my analysis of each of the photos, and there's one for each, each council. The um, next thing I'd like to discuss uh, is uh, uh, one, of, one of the town residents pointed out uh, an article, uh, a report from the Office of Legislative Report. It's identified as OPM 2-28-98, and it should be in the record. We can, we can put that up on the monitor. And what it did, what this report did, is identify some of the some of the some, some of the characteristics and, and what was happening as a result of various towns adopting various life citation ordinances around the state. Uh, in this in this OLR report, Office of Legislative Research report, uh, it noted that New Britain stopped importing stopped enforcing its anti blight ordinance when the state's attorney, Jim Gray, the state's attorney raised questions about his constitutionality. Uh, if I were an attorney, I would raise questions about his constitutionality. I think it is highly <coughs> unconstitutional, but I am not an attorney. Uh, Hartford repealed his ordinance after property owners ignored the fines. Chair, point of order. This yes. is already information that's been presented before it is in the public document. Okay, thank you. Could you move on to your next new, <coughs> new topic? Uh, I don't think that is. On the website, we've all read it. Oh, yes. have you read it? Yes. Okay. I, I, okay. Um, one of the things that is not on the website is that uh, the ledger blight, n number I on this list was the chief state attorney was concerned that some blight ordinance would allow a city or town to declare any vacant building to be blighted, regardless of its condition. Unfortunately, the ledger proposed flight citation ordinance contains the same provision. Any vacant building in Ledger, per the proposed ordinance, can be, can and would have to be determined blighted uh, if, if, uh, if it was forced to enforce the flight citation ordinance. Next thing I'd like to go to is the Montville flight citation ordinance, and this one should be in the correspondence. Um, <coughs> The, uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to have a long discussion with the Montville Light Enforcement Officer. Uh, the Montville Light Citation Ordinance has been in effect for about two years, and uh, uh, many of its provisions, uh, perhaps 90% of them, have been copied and are part of the proposed ledger of Light Citation Ordinance. Uh, I'd like to discuss to adjust, address the major differences between the two ordinances and to try to explain why the Montville ordinance is, well, it's, it's, it's deficient, but it's less deficient than the Ledger ordinance. Uh, the Montville ordinance requires a, required a, 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 a town-wide survey to be performed within 60, 60 days to identify all of the blighted properties. Uh, there is no blight survey requirement proposed in the Ledger blight. Light ordinance. Uh, it's not there. Uh, this omission will result in non even, incomplete, and unfair enforcement in Ledger. And I, I urge that, that if you do choose to, to adopt this, this ordinance, that you restore the survey requirement to help make the ordinance more fair. Uh, the Montville ordinance, in its definition of blight, includes a provision for premises that is attracting illegal activity as evidenced by multiple felony or misdemeanor arrests on the premises. Uh, this, pro this provision uh, has been omitted from the ledger ordinance, and I urge that it be restored. I believe that there's something else in the record suggesting that from one of the councils. Um, most blight ordinances, including the Montville ordinance, by definition, limits blight to what can be seen from a public view. And the Montville Ordinance very precisely defines public view. The Ledger Ordinance requires a public view requirement only for blight that is caused by debris, but does not require a public view for blight caused by structural decay or dilapidation. More importantly, it fails to define what is a public view. The failure to define what is a public view will create confusion, unequal enforcement, 
and, and lots of problems when it comes time to apply the ordinance. Uh, in my opinion, one of the most important deficiencies in the ledger ordinance is section six. Can we go to section six of the um, of the ledger by citation ordinance that'll be back in the uh, on the record. Uh, the ledger black citation ordinance in section six states, in addition to the citation process described herein, what a dangerous word, in addition. That means it's outside the scope of the enabling statutes. In addition. The flight enforcement officer is authorized to initiate legal proceedings in the Superior Court for the immediate, for the immediate correction of the violations, collections of any penalty, <coughs> and the recovery of all costs in the United States. This is simple. I cannot find anywhere where this is permitted. This is enabled. This is authorized in the Connecticut statutes. And unless there's an example in case law, which I'm not aware of, this is an unlawful provision. You cannot do it. It has to be removed. Uh, it's not in the Montville ordinance. It's not in any of the dozens and dozens of ordinances that I've looked at. It's wrong. Uh, the ledger blight citation ordinance definition for the term abandoned is by a reference to the 2009 amendment to the 2005 state building code. While the definition is reasonable for a building official, the definition is a source of many of the problems that I've identified uh, regarding those photographs. Uh, the Montville Ordinance does not define the word abandoned. It does not. The common dictionary definition of the word abandoned is sufficient. There is no need to have the contorted definition that's set in a revision to an old version of the building code. Mr. Treister, do you know how much longer you're planning to speak? Uh, uh, about five minutes. I'll give you five more minutes. You've been speaking 25, so I'll give you a total of 30 if we minutes. Go to the, uh, if we go to uh, the flight ordinance attorney memo, which is in the record, uh, in, in paragraph one of his report, the attorney states that I do not know what the term illegal residence in section 4 means. Uh, in my opinion, if the town attorney cannot figure out what illegal residence means, per the definition of the proposed ordinance, then likely neither will the public, the blight enforcement officer, or the blight hearing committee, or the court. And the resulting confusion constitutes a serious problem for the proposed blight ordinance. But I suspect that the real problem is that the attorney does know what it means and is unhappy with it. Uh, the definition of the ordinance is that any human habitation of a dwelling unit that does not comply with the state building code, does not comply with the state fire code, does not comply with local zoning regulations or any other codes and laws is an illegal residence, and an illegal residence for Section 4B is a fight. Uh, he also states in his paragraph 6 that the distinction between a citation and this notice should be clear, so should also should so also should be the distinction between the citation and this notice, and the notice that must be sent to a violator before a citation is issued, and the notice of hearing. It is obvious that in the attorney's position, opinion, there is confusion in the proper usage of the terms notice and citation. If he thinks there is confusion, then so will the public, the flight enforcement officials, the hearing committee, and the court. Ambiguity in ordinances is a disaster. This, this proposed flight citation ordinance is full of Last, I want to spend about three more minutes on unintended consequences. When I spoke with the flight enforcement official in Montville, he reported that uh, when they, the survey is not yet complete, even though it's supposed to be finished in 60 days, it's not yet complete. To date, they have 400 blighted properties. This is, this is about 10 times more than I had expected. A surprisingly large number of violators are constructing solid fencing on the front property line to block the public view of their flight. It is less expensive to hide it than it is to fix it. <coughs> There are a few cases where a resident who wants to remediate the blight, but due to financial reasons, they are unable to do so. At present, there is a Montville resident who has incurred in excess of a $40,000 blight penalty. She cannot pay, she cannot remediate, and Montville is now have, uh, paying for legal assistance to figure out what they're going to do next. Uh, he also recommended that the 
type enforcement official be a full-time position for the job to be properly performed. And they also reported that the determination of the legal ownership of blighted or closed properties is more time-consuming and difficult than originally expected because financial institutions sometimes delay the final steps necessary to gain full legal ownership of their properties. In summary, I believe an appropriate anti-blight ordinance might be needed for rare situations where both the zoning regulations and the building code are insufficient to prevent and remediate blight, which is rare. But the proposed blight citation ordinance is a sledgehammer that will be ineffectual, result in unlawful discrimination, will create lawsuits, be embarrassing to the town, and people will get hurt by it. I also believe the proposed ordinance is unnecessary because proper enforcement of the building code will address most blight caused by structural decay and dilapidation, and proper enforcement of Section 14.8 of the zoning regulations will address most blight caused by junk and debris. I respectfully urge the Council to reject the proposed blight citation ordinance. Thank you very much. And uh, I will pass out copies of my arguments for your deliberations uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak before the town council? Mr. Chair, oops, no. Thank you, Drew Wesley, 19 Galpo Road. I'd just like to take more. I just spoke to speak to the council before, but I'd just like to uh, speak a little bit more about what I mentioned before. And uh, Mr. Treese brought up some very good points about enforcement. And I would urge the council to look kind of holistically at the way the town approaches certain things. I've had an ongoing issue uh, myself and myself, my family and my wife, uh, regarding the property that's abutting me. And I've had a very hard time getting enforcement. Now, I know there was some <coughs> search that perhaps enforcement is not a uh, priority. And while they may, that may, not, it may or may not be uh, evident uh, Directly, it's it's implied. I've I've gone through numerous uh, cases where I've attempted to get the town to act, where I thought it was rightful to act against obvious and direct violations of the zoning regulations. Uh, that we seem to have a problem getting enforced. So, uh, a blight ordinance is good. I think Mr. Schuster brought up an interesting point that a blight ordinance should be a supplement to the zoning building regulations and allow the town to take action <coughs> in those areas where perhaps the zoning break is not sufficient or a building code is not sufficient. So I think a flight ordinance does definitely have a place, but I think the town as a whole needs to take a look at enforcement. As a property owner, I kind of rely on the town to look out for my property interests just as other residents do as well, and that any actions the town does take to enforce are done with the thought that they're protecting the interests of the property owner and the values of those properties. I would have a hard time selling my property right now when somebody looks out my back window, sees three 20-foot Pinex boxes in a front yard, sees abandoned vehicles, sees a trailer with the wheels removed that probably hasn't moved since 1992, and obvious violations of the building code uh, an illegal business being conducted on the property that's been investigated but not enforced. So laws and regulations are good, but without enforcement, they have no, no power effect. So I would ask the town as a whole to take a holistic look <coughs> at how enforcement is meted out and how important it is to the property owners of the town. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Would anybody else like to speak before the town council? Terry Worry about 32H Flint Rock Road in Ledger. Um, I am before you tonight to state my opposition of the Ledger, the proposed Ledger uh, Light Ordinance. Um, our community has demonstrated that in times of hardship and tragedy that we can come together to offer support to those who are in need. And I feel the issue concerning blight is no different than those. The proposed blight ordinance fails to take into consideration hardships failed, faced by some members of our community or through no fault of their own cannot remedy the blight. 
There is no provision in the ordinance for those with disabilities or who have fallen on financial difficulties that are so prevalent in these times. To cite and find residents who are willing to rectify the blight but do not have the necessary needs to do so would only cause them to fall on hard times. I do not see this as being a productive solution to the issue. I see a stringent ordinance as polarizing the haves from the have-nots in town and placing the hardship on the have-nots with the rights of wealthier homeowners potentially stomping on the property rights of owners of the older, smaller, mill-style houses in town. The right to acquire and own property and to deal with it and use it as the owner chooses, so as long as the use harms nobody, is a natural right. It does not owe its origin to the Constitution. It existed before them. It is a part of the citizen's natural liberty, an expression of his freedom guaranteed as invalid by every American Bill of Rights. I feel that the proposed ordinance is an attempt to <coughs> replace our property rights with privileges. <coughs> what message are you sending when a citation is issued, the town leans on the property, and possibly tails the property? How will the blight ordinance citation prevent blight, especially when there are no funds for remediation or when the blight consists of decayed structures? The town cannot offer residents with any degree of certainty that enacting the proposed ordinance will rectify, rectify the blight issue. <coughs> the town of Ledger has previously and currently demonstrated a tremendous lack of enforcement in ordinances, commission committees, and boards that are previously ratified. <coughs> Under Section 2, Item A of the <coughs> ordinance, it states that the town may issue citations, establish penalties, and issue means to prevent housing blight. The question remains as to how the blight ordinance citation will prevent the blight. Will the enforcement officer issue a citation to each member of our community that owns or occupies real property? How will enforcement be conducted? Will the enforcement officer patrol house by house or street by street? Will a patrol take place daily? weekly, monthly. The proposed ordinance under section three states no owner of real property and then under section five, it changes it to owner and occupant of the property. If it applies to both the owner and the occupant, in which I shall assume the property owner and the tenant, one could assume two citations would be given, two liens would be placed on the property. If the word ordinance were removed from this proposal, I would consider it stealing. I do not want to live where monetary gain is obtained through theft. For example, <coughs> we have Jack and George, and they're very friendly neighbors. Jack has three cords of wood stacked neatly on the side of his house, and George has no complaint about the wood pile. Jim and Marty are not friendly neighbors. Like Jack, who lives two streets over, Marty has the same three cord wood pile neatly stacked against the side of the house. Jim filed a, a blight complaint. How will the enforcement officer enforce the proposed ordinance equally? In addition, what about the busybody neighbor who could make a blight complaint every day? How is it possible to have fair and uniform enforcement under the proposed ordinance with the ambiguity and circular logic of the definition of blight? If this ordinance is adopted, it is imperative that it be enforced across the board. I worry that proposed changes to increase the power of town officials to enforce the ordinance and encouraging neighbors to do what amounts to snitching on each other engender a slippery slope from the right of the individual being overridden by government. I understand Ledger wants the town to look marketable to attract businesses, but where does that end? What is next? Are you going to tell us what color to paint our houses or tell us to take down our clotheslines? Alternatively, that the proposed ordinance would give an overzealous blight enforcement officer the right to issue a citation and find people who have a torn screen or a cracked window. I see this topic as a community issue, not a government issue. The role of government regarding this issue should be as a facilitator of positive change. I fear what too much government interference could do to the quality of life in our town. We have to remember what community is. 
community is coming together in happy times and sad times, lending a hand and knowing you can reach out for help and depend on your neighbors. Laying aside our differences to accomplish a goal, whether it be mowing the lawn or hoping benefits for hurting families, we create our community. We build bonds and we come together. We come together for support, we come together for family, and we come together for fun. It is my opinion that a community is not based on its property values, but on its moral values. That is to say, a common set of beliefs that we adhere to in order to coexist peacefully and productively. I strongly feel this ordinance will divide our community through the shaming of a select few of our community members. This does nothing but spread bad blood by turning one against another. We can use this opportunity to build relationships within our community for people incapable of maintaining their property. We can form a volunteer citizens committee made up of non-governmental community members who can act as a conduit of communication. The proposed ordinance does not encourage communication. What Ledger needs are neighbors talking to neighbors and addressing problems within our communities with each other, not with our government. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, those folks in the back, you, there's lots of seats up in the front if you would like to um, come and sit up in the front. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, we're used to you being in the front row, and you threw us off by being back in the middle. <laughs> Address the count. Um, Mr. Cherry. Hi, good evening. Mike Cherry, 5 from Pool Drive, Pales Ferry. I'm also chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I'm going to keep our remarks short because you've already heard a bit. Uh, a couple of things I know of from having participated in this process since it was envisioned. I remember discussions on lot those let's make a list and why we didn't put those into ours because it wasn't to go make a list and figure out who's been naughty and who's been nice. And I think I answered some of Carol's questions. It was to give us a tool we could use to enhance public health and safety, which is the section this falls under, 7148, and down into where we have flooding is public health and safety. Uh, I applaud both admin and uh, land use for the changes they made based on previous public hearings. They looked good. They answered the questions. It brought in the public act from last year. Uh, I will point out that housing blight is a general term. That doesn't mean residential blight. If you actually look at the 171 documents that fall under OLR and CGA since 1998 with the word blight in them, it becomes clear. The one document that was referenced previously and is online does have a section that is interesting. In the 98 document, it does talk to court cases. And if you take a look, it says there aren't any. So true, there's a lot of things that were pointed out 15 years ago, but since then, a lot's happened in the world of light, light ordinances, like of course. Uh, there's a recent uh, court case world of zoning that deals with enforcement, and it deals with writs of mandamus and injunctions trying to force zoning enforcement officers to enforce <coughs> zoning regulations. And the courts have found, the appeals have been filed, the, superior, the Supreme Court has said they're not going to hear it, they affirmed it, that it's a discretionary act, and discretionary acts cannot be forced by writs of mandamus or injunctions. I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer, but boy, it sure sounds like the same thing. So I wouldn't worry about writs and mandamus and injunction. I'd worry about life. Uh, I, I applaud your efforts, and I'll stop to my short. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak with the council? Yes. Good evening, council members. My name is Jason Moringa. 
I'm a former, former cable technician and I've spent six years working in the town of Ledger. I've been inside and stood face to face with many of the people that would be considered offenders under the blind ordinance. Early in my career, I, I carried a feeling of disdain whenever I was called to a job at one of these residences. The many obstacles within and without the house made it difficult for me to do my job in an efficient manner. However, it was my job and I had to make the best of the situation. The interesting thing about cable guys is that we are part of we are part cable technician and part therapist. People will open up and say the darkest things to a cable guy. As the years pass, I found that people whose houses I was called upon to fix a problem would have a story to tell. Some of these stories humorous, some appalling and heart-wrenching. What stood out to me most about these stories and the people that conveyed them to me was a sense of relief and satisfaction that they were able to express something that they were dying to get off their chest. Nine times out of ten, the first thing out of a person's mouth whose yard was in disrepair was, I apologize for the mess. Words such as these do not come from the mouths of people who have a careless mindset, which is the common reaction from frustrated citizens about their neighbor's messy yard. I have a different view on the subject based on some of the first-hand testimony I have heard. An elderly woman who two years ago had lost her husband. She has no family in the state, and due to her severe arthritis, cannot even navigate the stairs to get to the lower level of her house. While repairing her cable, she asked if I would bring up a couple of boxes for her. I comply, and she is thrilled to be able to look through the photo albums I retrieved for her. She tells me times are hard because her husband's illness left them penniless, and she lives on Social Security. Her property could be cited under this flight ordinance. The young couple with two children. The mother is suffering from terminal cancer. The father has cut back his hours at work in order to care for his dying wife while trying to manage to care for, for two children. The yard has fallen into disrepair due to lack of motivation because of the dire circumstances. These people would be cited under the flight ordinance. Under the flight ordinance. I was called to a home where I had to put on a full surgical uniform, complete with a face mask, because the six-year-old girl inside has a rare immune disorder that leaves her body without any, any, any immune defense to the point where a common cold would be fatal. Again, the property was in disrepair. This family could be cited under this flight ordinance. An elderly man has given up faith on his community and humanity in general. His wife has died, he has no friends, and through constant ridicule from his neighbors regarding the mess in his yard, he creates more of a mess in defiance. He watches television and drinks himself into oblivion. His property would be cited under the blind ordinance. These are just a few of the testimonies I've accumulated throughout the years, but there are many more, and these are all community members that live in the town of Ledger. It is through these testimonies I found my disgust for having to work in these surroundings turned to that of empathy for the struggles these people are suffering from. I ask those of you who sit before me, if you can, with a clear conscience, pull the trigger on these families, or any family or families with, with similar circumstances. My opposition to this ordinance comes from personal experience and those who share this community with me. There are people in this community, community who needlessly suffer because they do not know when or how to ask for help. <clears throat> It is my experience that a person's surroundings are a direct reflection of what is going on inside of them. Oftentimes, this can be a cry for help. This community must come together on its own accord to negate the threat of abuse by inhuman illnesses such as this one. First, we need to communicate. I understand there are frustrated community members who are concerned about property values or just overall appearance of their neighborhood. However, if you have been met with resistance to your request for your neighbor to clean up his yard, then I would say you are not communicating effectively. I propose you bring your problem to a roundtable discussion where unbiased third parties can give their input and perhaps come up with a better way to reach out to your neighbor while avoiding conflict. Where there is a will, there is a way. Next, I propose we visit the idea of a revitalization program made up of volunteers who are willing to give their time and help those who are incapable of cleaning up their property. With a small group of people, a lot, a lot can be accomplished. Let's face it, this is not brain surgery, it's physical labor. 
hauling away brush and debris, moving wood, painting, trimming are all within the capabilities of our community. Last, in order to accomplish these goals, I would ask the town to make available to us the use of its assets such as rakes, shovels, chainsaws, perhaps a tractor, dump truck, any other miscellaneous equipment we may need to get the job done. Again, we are only taking talking about time and labor to enact drastic change and at little to no cost to taxpayers. Only a willingness to come together to help those who cannot help themselves is needed. I will be the first to volunteer my time and energy, and I'm sure there is at least one other person in this room tonight that would stand with me. In closing, I believe that we can help revitalize even if we can help revitalize even one property, the snowball effect would be enormous. We would be a community who demonstrates that we can take care of our own. We don't turn a blind eye to needless suffering, and we certainly don't add to a person's suffering. We will set an example for future generations, showing them how a real community should work. We don't sit in our glass houses and throw stones. We get out and do the work that causes change. We will reinstate a sense of pride, not only in our dwellings, but also in each individual as a human being within our community. By helping, we may get hope and a renewed sense of humanity for those who have lost these important parts of the human experience. I believe if we put this ordinance aside, sit down to talk, and work out a plan, work out a plan that is not only sustainable in the long run, but also brings our society back from the brink of destruction, that we are moving in a positive direction. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Does anybody else wish to speak before the town council? Hearing none, this public hearing is adjourned. Uh, we're going to take a fight. Um,